So good morning, everybody. It's a real pleasure to have you all coming for this uh, um, conference today. So just a little uh, forward uh, to uh, um, first uh, thank also the speakers that have uh, some of them come from a long way to uh, to join us in Paris today. So this uh, the program of today is. Uh, Interestingly, a combination of people who come from developmental biology, cell biology, and physics. And they all share a passion for understanding morphogenesis. And you know, we know that this field of developmental biology has become increasingly interdisciplinary in the past few um, years, a decade or so. But in fact, it's good to remember that looking back at the history of embryology and biology, that actually the links between physics and biology have been, are very old. Um, you can definitely see uh, very strong connections between um, the understanding of living organisms from the 17th century, 18th century, and you know, at least the first half of the 19th century, um, when basically understanding how an organism develops and functions is basically a story of how energy fluxes um, are working through organisms at different scales, and it's only really the advent of chemistry which really um, established the basis of heredity, for one thing, and what happens in the 20th century that has somewhat led to a separation uh, between the physical understanding of living processes and what we now call biology. Biology being even coined from Lamarck only in 1804 and Treverinus in Germany. So really, I want to emphasize that in a way, having physicists and biologists working together now uh, in developmental biology is really going back to a long tradition of life science. And so we should not be too much surprised by that, but just be very happy that the infrastructure allows such um, interbreeding. And I think that today's conference will be, um, uh, will witness actually such uh, interbreeding in terms of concepts um, um, and as well as approaches. So we have a rich menu. The order of speakers is not quite random, but not very structured. It really goes and progresses by scale, I think. So we'll begin with three speakers who will be addressing the mechanics and some features of organization within cells, or at least at uh, cellular levels, or in organisms that behave as if they were a giant cell. So we'll begin with Eva Palour, um, who is from uh, University College London, on the move to Cambridge. Um, and. Um, Eva is a physicist, but she has been working for many years in the biophysics of cells, um, and now um, some aspects of tissues as well. So um, Eva um, will um, talk about the mechanobiology of cell shape, and we are very pleased to have you coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas, uh, for this very kind invitation. It's a Great honor to be here, and it's very nice to see so many old friends in the audience. Um, so yes, I will be, actually, I should have updated my title, but I will be talking about how cell shape is regulated. And so as Thomas highlighted, my lab is really a lab working at the interface of physics and biology to try to understand this question of cell shape. So the first, because Thomas asked us to give maybe a little bit of a broader introduction, so the first question I, I, I ask myself sometimes is why do we care about cell shape? And the reason we care about cell shape is because even though we all started by being a pretty round cell, and I think marie Ellen is going to tell you a lot about that cell, um, we, our organism is made of cells which come in a great variety of shapes, and that's important because their shape to a great extent determines what they do in terms of function. And also, cells can undergo very strong and rapid deformations when they do things like dividing or moving around. And it's very important that this happens in a very controlled manner, because precisely controlled deformations are key for, well, embryonic development to begin with. Again, we all started by being one cell. We are made of millions of cells which uh, arose by cell division. Uh, it's also important for many healthy processes like the immune response, wound healing. When you cut yourself, the wound closes. Uh, this is partly cell migration, partly cell division, uh, tissue homeostasis, and so on. And when things don't work properly, when cell shape is deregulated, then uh, pathologies can occur, such as cancer. And one of the hallmarks of cancer is that cells tend to have Ill, uncontrolled or not properly controlled shapes. So that's why we care about shapes. And 
uh, and many of us in the audience do. And the reason this is a very difficult question to address is because, well, to simplify maybe, the key problem in understanding cell shape is that this, it, it is, this is a question which fundamentally lies at the, uh, at the intersection of disciplines, and it's a question that fundamentally involves crossing scales. And what I mean by that is that shape matters at scales of about tens of microns, roughly speaking, and yet it's regulated at the molecular level by interactions between molecules which live at the nanometer scale, so three orders of magnitude smaller, and somehow the interaction of these tiny molecules, so the key ones maybe for control of shape here, uh, are here represented here in this electron micrograph. You have two actin filaments and a myosin motor in between, the scale is 50 nanometers, and somehow tens of thousands of these come together and self-organize, uh, which is the topic of the day, I suppose, into uh, supramolecular structures, which is, in the end, what determines shape. So it's not trivial how to go from what happens at this nanoscale level to what happens at the cell level, and I hope to give you some insights into how to go about this in this talk. And the other fundamental question in understanding shape is, again, if you come at it from a pure biology perspective, uh, or modern biology perspective, to link to Thomas' introduction, you would tend to deplete some proteins and see what happens, but this will not tell you why uh, shape has changed, because shape, in the end, and it doesn't matter if it's a cell, an organism, or the stable, is, in the end, a matter of mechanical forces exerted on the surface of the subject. So what we need to understand, if we want to understand shape, is how molecules make forces and how that, in turn, makes shape. And so to address this question, what we do in the lab and what I think many of the speakers today tend to do is we combine physics and biology, and more specifically in, in my lab, what we do is we combine cell and molecular biology to try to get at the molecules involved uh, with quantitative imaging to try to figure at the, as small scale as possible what these molecules are doing uh, and physical measurements of the forces they can be exerting. And we combine all this with modeling, which we do to a great extent in collaboration with Guillaume Salbreu, who will be speak speaking later today. Uh, and he's sitting there. Um, yeah, so that's been a great collaboration for 12 years now, I believe. And yeah, so that's the general approach. So what I'd like to tell you about today is a little bit, a, a couple of stories about how we can go from molecules to shape to some extent. And I will start by talking about something which has been the focus of my lab's research for, for over 10 years now, which is the control of the actin cortex. So the actin cortex is a, a cytoskeletal layer that lies underneath the plasma membrane in practically every somewhat rounded part of animal cells. So things that stick to a substrate look a bit different, but a dividing cell which is round or a spread cell, but in the cell body that's above the adhesion region, tends to have an actomycin cortex here in red at the surface. And in terms of forces and shape regulation, the key physical property of the cortex that matters is the fact that it is under contractile tension. And that's generated in this act actomycin network by myosin motors. And that's important for shape control, shape control because wherever a tension gradient arises, cells tend to contract, and this kind of processes drive many shape deformations, such as cytokinesis, for instance. So because tension is primarily generated by myosin motors, we and others have had a tendency for many years to kind of approximate levels of myosin to tension, and just to say, well, if you have a gradient of tension, it's probably because you have more myosins wherever the cell is contracting. And that is, generally speaking, true, but what I'd like to highlight is that it's not so trivial. And that's because the organization of the cortex is complex, and just changing levels of a molecule does not necessarily mean that tension will change. And what I mean by that is that, so the um, cytoskeletal structure where actomyosin contractility has been studied for longest, and which, where it's best understood, is the muscle sarcomere. So it's the same molecules. But in a muscle, it's quite clear that things are organized in a sort of optimal way for contractility generation, because you have parallel actin filaments, and myosin motors in between, and it's pretty obvious from this picture, and it's very structured and organized, that when myosins contract, the whole structure will shrink. But if you look at a cortex, so let's ignore stress fibers, let's talk about the cortex here, we don't really know what it looks like in terms of organization, but for all we know, it probably looks something like this. So you have a rather isotropic network of actin filaments in all kinds of directions. Somehow there's motors in there, and it's not, pretty, it's not completely obvious from this picture why this thing is contractile in the first place. We know experimentally that it is. Uh, but it's also not obvious that just changing levels of myosin is all that's going to make it more or less contractile. And so what, I like to, what, I, what I'm trying to highlight here is that in addition to just levels of, 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 of myosins, what we also need to understand if we want to understand cortex contractility is the nanoscale organization of this actin network and where things sit. And that's been difficult because, for experimental reasons pr 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 primarily, because the cortex is really a painfully thin structure to study. 
So this is a cortex at the surface of the mitotic cell, so the cell will undergo division. And that's what it looks like in confocal microscopy. So you see, well, there is a cortex, pretty clear. But that's about all we can say from this type of pictures. If we take like classical electron microscopy pictures, this is what you get. So it's this layer, this darkish layer here. This is a zoom on the side of the cell at the cell surface, which somehow generates the forces that drive cell rounding and cell division and so on. But still, we don't really get any insight into its architecture. So it's been difficult because it's too thin to be seen easily. And so for quite a, many, quite a few years now, we've been trying in the lab to develop tools to try to address this question of what does the cortex look like at the nanoscale in order to understand how the molecules that make it, uh, how do they make forces and tension. And so in a study which, which started already almost eight years ago, that was before super-resolution microscopy was easily available, uh, what we did is we used the distance between the plasma membrane and the actin layer underneath as a proxy for cortex thickness. It's a bit more complicated than that, but in practice, I mean, in, in, in essence, that's what this, this technique is about. And by doing so, we realized something pretty interesting, which is that if we compare cells in interface, so before division, and cells in mitosis, which undergo division, uh, which, so it's been known for a long time, and you can measure that, for example, by squishing cells under an AFM cantilever. It's been... Uh, Oh, sorry. Uh, it's been known for a long time um, that uh, if you compare cells in interphase and cells in mitosis, mitotic cells have a much higher cortex tension, so tension goes up when cells go in mitosis. And what we realize using this, this sub-resolution imaging tool is that actually the actin cortex is thinner and the myosin layer is also thinner, and if anything, there's a bit less myosin density at the cortex in mitotic cells. So tension is higher, and yet it's not just because we have more cortex or more myosin in there and something else is going on. And to, 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 to make a long story short, what we did by combining experiments and, uh, and um, theory in collaboration with Guillaume is we developed a model to try to figure how changing the organization of the actin network could change tension independently of motors. Uh, and the idea is that, so this was a very simplified model from the perspective of theory. We just put basically actin filaments, myosin motors, which pull on actin filaments, and crosslinkers, which attach the actin filaments together in a big sort of three-dimensional thin layer simulation of the cortex, and we could see, and that's something which was supported by experiments, that actually cortical tension is going to, first of all, depend independently, so at an equal level of myosin, myosin is not changed in the simulation, cortex tension is going to depend on the length of actin filaments and, as a result, the thickness of a cortical network in a way that is completely non-trivial. Uh, so it's non-intuitive in a way. Um, and that's because basically by modulating the length of actin filaments in the network, you make the network more or less well connected for tension generation. So if I, if I am to go through this curve in very simplified terms, you could say that if actin even if you have loads of myosins in there, so that's the blue rods, if actin filaments are too short, the whole thing is sort of not percolated, things are not connected, and you can't build the tension in any sort of effective manner, then as filaments get longer, tension can build up, Again, we are not changing myosin. And then when filaments get even longer, what we think is happening, but that's speculation at this point, is that this whole network becomes too, much, too entangled and too crosslinked, and it cannot generate tension in, in, an effect, in as effective a way as if it's more malleable at this kind of intermediate architectural uh, features here. So the conclusion of all this was that changing the architecture of the network without changing myosins can change tension, and that's something that the cells can use when they generate tension gradients for cellular deformations. So building from there, that got us really interested in trying to understand better how uh, the, co the cortex is arranged at the nanoscale. And the, uh, this was pretty much at the time where, where super resolution became more available, and so we started wondering how much can we learn if we try to look more in depth into this network. And one thing we wondered about, so this is an electron microscopy picture of the surface of the cortex. All these are presumably actin filaments. So you see it's a very dense network of actin. The scale bar is 100 nanometers. And what we wondered about once we started thinking about sizes of molecules generating tension is how does this actually work, given that the molecules that make tension, which are myosin mini filaments, are actually huge compared to the mesh size of this meshwork. So this is a myosin mini filament in a non-muscle cell drawn to scale on top of this picture. It's about 300 nanometers in length. It's much bigger than the mesh size. And that made us wonder, do they actually, we always assume that they're everywhere in the network, but are they? How, how do they get in there? And so what Binyan, who was a postdoc in the lab for, from, for a few years, did is he developed a two-color super-resolution uh, microscopy uh, imaging approach to image actin and myosin together in, at the cortex of cells. 
So this is what it looks like in a mitotic cell. So they pretty much overlap. That's fine. The cortex is rather thin in mitosis. But the striking, striking discovery was to find that in cases where the cortex is a little bit thicker, like in interface cells, what we tend to see is that myosin, which is in magenta here, does not quite overlap with actin at the cortex. And in quite a few regions, so this is after careful color correction, which is obviously a problem in this kind of techniques, after careful color correction, what you can see is that there is this kind of overhang of myosin here at the cytoplasmic side of the cortex. So that suggests that some myosin motors don't get through the cortical layer quite as effectively as uh, they would need to if they were to go everywhere inside the cortex. So I'm going to be very quick on the findings. So this is something we're currently writing up, and it should be on BioArchive, I hope, soon. But the general idea here that based on this, we, pro we, we hypothesize that what's going on is that myosin is not getting into the actin network due to pure steric hindrance. It's basically too big to freely diffuse. And just a few uh, snapshots of how uh, we, we go about, about demonstrating such a thing. Well, we could modulate both the architecture of the cortex and the activity of myosin motors to see how that affects how deeply they get into the cortex. So this is somewhat of a heavy slide, but the general conclusion, and there's no need to look into details, is that basically you can change the level of overlap between actin and myosin from not much to a lot to, even to, to not much at all by changing myosin activity. So basically myosin it cannot diffuse into the cortex, but it can work on actin filaments. So if it's more active, it's going to get deeper in the network. If it's less active, it's going to get less deep in the network. You can also change to what extent it gets into the cortex by changing cross-linking in the network. And in essence, if there's lots of branching, then myosin has trouble getting into the cortex. If there's little branching, myosin gets into the cortex more easily. And that all this changes the, all this overhang I mentioned. So you can get it, for example, by, the, by, block, by blocking up the three activity and decreasing branching in the network. You can see that the magenta overhang layer disappears practically, and myosin just gets into the cortex completely. And what's striking about all this is that the level of overhang completely correlates with tension in the cortex. And so that suggests that the level, to what extent myosin enters into the cortical network is a way of regulating how much tension is going to be generated. And that's something which could be somewhat called regulation just by steric effects, because we don't think there's much uh, biochemical regulation to that. And it's really about how does this big molecule get inside the cortical network. So the conclusion of this bit is that myosin motors, first of all, are kind of too large to freely diffuse into the actin cortex. And what, like the, the, the mind picture I have of what's going on, and I have no direct evidence for this at this point, I should highlight, but what, what we think is going on is that basically depending on how dense, cross-linked, and possibly other detailed features of the network uh, are, depending on what the network looks like, myosin motors can get into the network, and then they are very effective at generating tension, and that's what seems to be happening in mitosis, or they can struggle getting into the network, and when that's the case, it might be that there are some myosin motors which are kind of attached to the cortex by one side, but sort of hanging out in the side, hanging over in the cytoplasm with the other side. And that's not a configuration which is very conducive for tension generation. So, um, and so the way we hope to be able to address this question the, the further and to understand if this is really what's going on, do we have these ineffective myosins bound to the cortex but not making tension? is by using live super-resolution microscopy. So one can use structured elimination microscopy to actually image single myosin motors in the cortex uh, because they are so big. And, and, and structural elimination microscopy has a resolution of about 100 nanometers. So we can basically label myosin heads in green in this case and myosin centers of a mini filament in magenta. And if you express these constructs, what you can see, practically every red dot here is an individual myosin mini filament in four minutes of the life of the cortex of a cell. And so we hope to build on this, and I have a postdoc who just joined to, to work, on, that, to work on, this, on this question, to basically combine static super-resolution imaging of how things localize with dynamic imaging of myosin uh, behavior, hopefully with some electron microscopy insight into what actin is actually, uh, what, what the actin network actually looks like in 3D, uh, to now use this as now realistic inputs into this kind of at this point still simplified models of tension generation inside the cortex to really understand what happens when a cell forms a tension gradient. So building from this, I'd like to somewhat switch gears and tell you more a bit, uh, a little bit more about uh, the molecular regulation of shape per se, because so far I focused mostly on the cortex. But actually another question we became interested in along the, uh, along the way is uh, 
why is it that in some cells actin looks cortical and in some cells it looks like this? So this is an interface cell spread on a petri dish. It has stress fibers all over the place. It has some lamellipodia. Um, and it, and, and uh, the organization of actin looks completely different from what it looks like in round cells. And we all kind of believe that this transition from spread to round and back is driven by reorganization of the actin network, but we don't really understand how that's controlled at the molecular level. There are some upstream regulators which are known, like rho GTPases and so on, but that doesn't tell you how actin network organization is actually changed. And here again, I'm mostly going to highlight the approach and just give you some of the conclusions. So what we wanted basically is, so there's about 150 to 200 known actin binding proteins in cells, and we wondered whether is, are there like characteristic subgroups of these that can be identified that control that, the fact that actin looks like this or like this, or is it much more complex than that? And that's a project which started with, in collaboration with Mark Petronsky, who now moved to industry, uh, and the postdoc who was in charge of this is Muriel Serre, who's moving to Pasteur actually very soon. And what she did is she took a very, actually it was a very brave project and I would never have started without Mark. Uh, so she, she basically decided to use a uh, home design uh, pull down assay to basically characterize what binds actin filaments in spread cells versus round cells. So she prepared extracts from cells synchronized in, in G2 in this case where they look spread and in metaphase where they look round and then use beads which are coated with phalloidin um, so these beads will bind actin filaments that come from these extracts and everything that binds to actin filaments. And then she did mass, mass spectrometry on this, um, comparing the, we can call it the F-actin interactome, although that sounds a bit pompous, uh, in, um, in um, spread cells and in round cells. And so she found what you find with mass spec, which is a list of proteins. And so now we have a list of proteins that we know is enriched in interface spread cells, which have stress fibers and lamellipodia, and then uh, and a list of actin binding proteins, or proteins we find bound to the, to the F actin fraction of these extracts coming from round cells in mitosis. So we are doing, I'm not gonna go into the interface side of things, we've been doing follow-ups follow on this to try to see when we deplete these, do, do, do cells change shape in very short, not if you deplete one, but if you deplete subgroups of two, sometimes you can affect the transition from a spread cell to a round cell. But what I'd like to focus on linking to the first part of the talk is what the mitotic uh, um, fraction does. So as a first readout of how these proteins might affect cortical actin organization in mitosis, what we did is again an assay to measure the thickness of the cortical network, except that from the previous studies things has progressed and we can now measure this directly using super resolution microscopy. We don't need to do proxies about distance to membrane anymore. So we basically use STORM, uh, which, is, uh, which is a super resolution technique to measure the thickness of the cortical network directly. And so we did it on all these regulators that Muriel identified and rich in mitosis. And the one I'd like to tell you more about in the last, how many minutes? Thank you, Dr. Gerstel. In the last few minutes, um, yeah, uh, is, is the fact that we actually surprisingly found intermediate filaments, vimentin and plectin, um, having an effect on cortical organization. So, Vimentin is an intermediate filament which is known to be involved in migration, for example, but its role in mitosis have been rather elusive at this point, and that's in part because there's a number of papers indicating that uh, vimentin networks disassemble in mitotic cells, and that's true in some cell types, apparently. It turns out it's not true in the cells we've been looking at, which are HeLa, but we also started looking at uh, other cell types now, such as embryonic stem cells, uh, which we also investigate in the lab. And turns out that actually vimentin networks, so the intermediate filament networks, are not quite disassembled when cells enter mitosis. And what we found is that when we deplete vimentin or plectin, which is a linker between vimentin and actin, the thickness of the cortical network increases. So we get a thicker cortex if we get rid of intermediate filaments in mitosis, not in interface. So first of all, we checked, could that be? Because again, there was this dogma that there's no vimentin in mitosis. And if we image vimentin in, in, uh, in the cells we work with, we see a very clear, almost cortical layer of vimentin. So this is a storm image. It's actually not as continuous as it seems in this picture. If you would look in 3D, it's a bit patchy. But there seems to be what I call a subcortical layer of vimentin. And I say subcortical because if you image in two-color storm, you can see that it's kind of directly underneath, suggesting that it might be directly interacting with the actin network. So that made us wonder about something which actually we had discussed, I think, with, with people like Guillaume and Jean-Francois already 15 years ago, which was that maybe there's something under the cortex which kind of resists the cortex. Could it be? Could it be that this vimentin layer, 
so we meant in layers tend to have high elasticity and not very fast turnover. Could it be that this actually physically resists the cortex and when we get rid of it, we get a thicker cortex because this physical resistance to cortex growth and contraction is gone. So I don't have a completely clear answer to that question except that it's possible, but to sort of get an uh, idea of whether that might be the case, we did an, a bit of a weird experiment which is lay, trying to laser ablate that layer. So we basically use a laser which we focus, so this is Vimentin now in the cell, which we focus on uh, regions where we have a high level of Vimentin and then we shoot a hole in this. So we know we don't affect actin too much because if we shoot a hole in actin, we get a bleb. So in this case, we try to go under the cortex. Sometimes we don't manage and we get a bleb. But when we manage to go under the cortex, what we see, and I'm not sure how easy it is to see in the movie, but that basically this side of the cell somewhat flattens. It's gonna play again, but I show you some stills in a second. So if you, measure curvature around the surface of the cell, color-coded here. So this is before ablation, curvature is in the yellow side, so rather high, and then when we ablate, we see that this region here becomes flatter. And if you wait long enough, it's gonna relax. Um, so this suggests um, that there is a layer of the mentin underneath the actin cortex, which somehow physically resists the cortex. What that means exactly, I don't know at this point, but the speculation is that maybe First of all, it may resist further growth of the cortex toward the cytoplasmic network. What I don't know is whether this is about polymerization of actin filaments or whether this is about constraining the organization, basically pushing them so that the whole network becomes thinner in that way. Now, the question, of course, is does it matter for cell division? Because I highlighted in the first part of the talk that the organization of the actin network is important for generating tension and allowing the cells to divide properly. And so what we found, first of all, is that depleting the, the Vimentin layer, so we knew it increases tension. It, uh, sorry, we knew it increases thickness because, again, maybe it relaxes the cortex and allows it to grow thicker. What we do find is that it decreases tension at the cortex, but also, and that's possibly an effect of that, it seems to, to perturb the ability of the cell to round up properly. So this is a Vimentin depleted cell, as the labels are gone, I'm sorry, uh, where you see that it's less round than the control cell, and so does that matter? Well, these cells divide fine if you look at them in a dish. But what's been shown by, uh, by a number of people at the lab of Busbaum, among others, is that mitotic rounding is particularly important when cells divide in a constrained environment, such as a tissue. But what, the way we look at this is we can put them under a pad of gel, agar gel, basically, to, to just put up resistance for them uh, to, uh, to, for division. And so what's been, what's been shown, basically, is that when cells don't round up properly, uh, in this kind of condition, then they tend to have mitotic defects just because they have trouble positioning the spindle properly and making a uh, well-arranged mitotic plate. And so what we observe is that the vimentin depleted cells in that situation uh, have a really hard time rounding up, and that does lead to all kinds of defects in mitosis, uh, which are much enhanced compared to the uh, con uh, control cells. So they have all kinds of things like multipolar spindles, chrom chromosomes lagging, and so on, and that's because the spindle at least that's what the literature suggests, is that that's because the spindle doesn't have the physical space to assemble properly. So to conclude, um, the conclusion of this mass spectrometry approach is first of all that the regulation of actin network organization is not just down to one magic protein which makes actin switch from being stress fiber-like to being cortex-like. I guess that's not particularly surprising, but it's, it's, good, to, to, it's good to know. Uh, however, we can identify, and I didn't tell you much about that, some key regulatory modules that can be, uh, if, if you perturb them in groups, that can change actin organization. But the last part of the talk, what I think it highlights in a, in, a, in a way that I find particularly puzzling, is that actually, as much as we have been studying the actin cortex sort of in isolation, its interaction with the rest of the cell, in this case, intermediate filaments networks, but you could also wonder about things like the membrane, affects its architecture and its organization, and the tension it generates and its function in, uh, in, in what the cell is doing. And so I think this highlights that we really need to try to look at the cell as a whole and not only uh, from the perspective of the uh, particular structure we're interested in. And with this, I'm just going to thank the people involved. So uh, the first part of the work on, uh, was started by all the uh, former alumni here, but the super resolution part was mostly the work of Vignan, who was a fantastic postdoc in the lab, who left recently. And then Muriel uh, is single-handedly responsible for all the mass spectrometry part and the follow-ups. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.